turn if you would this time I mean it Genesis 34 <laughs> Wrong. I mentioned the wrong verse this morning, but we're, this is where we want to start with uh, Genesis 34. By way of introduction, well, let me tell you the title first. The title is simply Your Friends. Okay, Your Friends. Um, more particularly, we we're going to talk about who your friends should be. Okay. So your friends, by way of introduction, let me tell you first the types of friends that you don't want, okay? Because the Bible gives us a lot of examples, actually, of people who were called friends, and they ended up not being friends. A good example of that is Judas, all right? Jesus said, hey, who's going to betray me? The one that comes and gives me a kiss. And when Judas comes with those guards to arrest Jesus, he comes up to him, and Jesus says, friend, all right? He calls him a friend because... They should have been friends, but he ended up not being a good friend. There's a lot of examples about that. So let me give you a few uh, verses here, uh, examples of what kind of friend we don't want to be. Look at Genesis 34, and uh, I love this passage. I can't preach from the passage itself, so I'm going to try to keep this part brief. But uh, starting there in verse 1, it says, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And I can't help but when I see that, I always think about ladies' night out. You ever hear people, we're having ladies' night out, right? The ladies of the land go get together and they go paint the town, okay? And she went to go see the daughters of the land. Now, here's what happens sometimes. If you get wrong the wrong friends, wrong influences, uh, they don't stop you from making bad choices and they don't protect you from things. And, and so here's what it says in verse 2. And when Shechem, probably a good-looking man, I'm guessing, when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hittite, prince, doesn't every woman want a prince in her life? He's prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. Now, when you read the whole story in context, I don't have time to get to it now, but I don't get the indication that it was a rape or that she was forced when nobody else saw her or whatever. I think he was just a good-looking guy. She was with the ladies. They probably encouraged her, said, this you know, there's the prince over there. He's got eyes for you. And they ended up doing something that they shouldn't do. Okay, so, and his soul uh, clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father, Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. <clears throat> And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field. And Jacob held his peace until they were come. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field uh, when they heard it. And the men were grieved. And they were very wroth because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, uh, which thing ought not to be done. Now, there's lots of reasons that shouldn't have been done. Okay, first of all, the Bible's very, very clear that there shouldn't be that type of a relationship outside of marriage, so they should have been married first, okay? But not only that, these people weren't believers, you know? They were, uh, they were, you know, children of that region that they were at, but they weren't believers like Dinah and uh, Jacob and his sons, and, and the, they didn't follow the God of Abraham and of Isaac and all those, uh, you know, well, he is Isaac, but <laughs> they didn't, uh, you know, this was early on when, and, uh, and you didn't see these other guys, they're still worshiping idols and all this kind of stuff, and so look, this, this is not good. We don't want the godly seed to go out and intermingle Right. And to have those types of relationships and get married and all this kind of stuff with those who aren't believers. And so this was a big deal. But the thing is that whatever those friends are, the daughters of the land that she went out to go see, they certainly weren't good friends. You know, they didn't keep her from doing it. Probably encouraged. I know I'm using a little bit of liberty there, but isn't that true? You know, sometimes you get around. Uh, I'm talking particularly to the ladies right now, but get around ladies and uh, you start talking. Let's say you're married, but you start talking to them about uh, your husband or whatever. And they might give some bad counsel, you know, about how you should treat, how you should respect, uh, respond to him and all this kind of stuff. They could give you some bad counsel. We want to be very careful about that. Similar uh, story, I guess. Second Samuel 13. Samuel. 
2 Samuel 13. And again, this is just introduction. I'm trying to tell you a few examples of bad friends that you don't want to have. 2 Samuel 13. Let's start in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister. Okay, it's actually a half-sister, okay, but it's still. Uh, David had a, ha a, fair, a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything unto her. And Amnon had a friend. Now, you read this story, you say, well, he, he was not a friend, okay, but he, he was had the title of being a friend, but he wasn't a friend. Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother. And look at this. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. Subtle man. That's what the devil was, by the way, in the Garden of Eden. He was subtle, more subtle than all the beasts of the field, right? He devised these wicked plans and these wicked schemes. And this, uh, this friend, quote unquote friend, was subtle. And he saw... Uh, he saw this uh, Amnon there pining away in love for somebody he never should have had those types of feelings for. And it wasn't love, by the way. It was lust, a big difference. Someone says that they love, and actually what they mean is I have a feeling and a desire for them that's that, uh, this urge, you know, that, that's, that's not right. And, uh, and they would, uh, in, the right, in the right context, it's okay. In, in a marriage relationship, it's okay, but not in that sense. And so uh, anyway, he has this, and he's sick to his stomach, and he can't sleep, and, and he goes to uh, this guy who's his friend, and he says, you want her? I can tell you how to get her. And he gives him bad advice, and, and he ends up uh, actually forcing his half-sister into a relationship and uh, – and then you know what happens? This is usually what happens when you fall into wickedness because of bad, uh, bad examples in your life or whatever. Afterwards, his hatred for her was more than his love for her was before the, the thing. Because it's finally got the lust out of the way. And then he's like, I don't really love her. And now he hated her. He despised her. And so uh, this is the kind of thing. And, and if, had it not been for Amnon's so-called friend, Jonadab, that probably wouldn't have happened. If he would have had a good friend that would slapped him in the face and said, what are you thinking? <laughs> you, you get over yourself. Stop having those kinds of feelings and, and, and just do something. He would have saved all the hassle that happened. And so we got to be careful. Look at Proverbs uh, 27. If you kind of go to the middle of your Bible, you'll probably be in Psalms. And if you go over one book to the right, you'll be in Proverbs. And Proverbs 27, verse 6. I read this this morning in the first uh, uh, message. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Sometimes we need that person in our life that's going to wound us, tell us something that hurts a little bit that we didn't necessarily want, you know, and uh, they're going to have to do that. But that's better than the kisses of an enemy, right, that's going to flatter you and deceive you and try to say all these wonderful words. They're not really your friend unless they're trying to help you and trying to speak truth and love. We talked about that already. So, uh, so look now, if you would, you're already in Proverbs 27. So look over a couple of chapters to chapter 29. Speaking of flattery, here's what it says in uh, verse 5. Proverbs 29, verse 5. A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. So if all you're hearing is good, pleasant words and flattery and good things, and they will never tell you what you're doing wrong, uh, or say something at the risk of maybe hurting your feelings or offending you, uh, then really you got to be careful. There might be a trap involved. There's a snare at your feet, a net at your feet, and, uh, and we got to be careful about that. So be, there, there is a type of friend that you don't want, okay? And uh, it doesn't mean don't be nice to people, but that you don't have to enter into that type of a friendship with uh, some of these folks. Again, always remember this, that Jesus even called... 
Judas, his friend. And uh, Judas obviously was not a friend. He betrayed him, and, uh, and, and as a result, obviously, he went to the cross, which, I, which, he, which he needed to, but in that case, Judas was not a good friend. Okay? He's an example of somebody who would be a terrible friend. So who should our friends be? Or who should your friends be? I'm going to give you a few, uh, a few points here. Okay? Number one. Family is what I'm, the word that I, I want to say, but particularly I want to say this, your spouse, okay? Your spouse. Valerie and I have often said, hey, you're my best friend, but then we don't have a whole lot of friends. But, <laughs> but you know your spouse should be your best friend if you're married. I know some people in here aren't married, and uh, so I'll get to you in a minute, okay? But if you are married, your spouse should be your best friend. Look at Song of Solomon. This is a book I do not preach from very often. <laughs> I believe you ought to preach from the whole Bible, but uh, uh, there are some chapters in this book that are a little difficult to preach, okay? Because this is a lot about a relationship between a husband and a wife. But if you look at Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, Solomon's uh, wife here is speaking about him, and she says, His mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. She's talking about her husband. This is my friend. It is possible and right and good to be a friend with your spouse. In fact, you should be a friend to your spouse. Matthew 19, 5 says, And this, uh, for this cause, as Jesus said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So uh, obviously, entering into that relationship with a spouse, I mean, you're one flesh. You know more about each other than anybody else you should. Uh, you know, I was just talking to Brother uh, uh, Jeff yesterday about the fact that it's sometimes hard to work when you're married and you work full time in another place and you're like eight hours, nine hours, 10 hours with the same people all the time and you get to know them and all about them and their ways and, and their manners and everything and then you go home and you're tired and you want to go to bed or you just want some downtime or whatever and there's your spouse, right? Who needs you and who should know you better than anybody else? But sometimes you forget to be a friend to them. Well, that actually should be your friend. And most of the time as Christians, the people on the workforce, they're not really doing much to help us spiritually. They're not doing help, much to help us stay pure and love the Lord and honor the Lord. A lot of times, in fact, they will do everything they can to drag you away from that and pull you away from that. You got to be careful. If, if you have a good Christian friend in the workforce, praise the Lord for that. If you've got a Christian boss, praise the Lord for that. The Bible talks about that, by the way. And you should be very, very thankful for that because most of the time that's not the case. But you do have a friend if you have a spouse, okay? You should. You should put a lot of time and investment into that relationship. And then we read this uh, this morning as well. A man uh, that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer to a brother. So uh, we need to be friendly to those. And we need to stick closer than even a brother. By the way, in this context, what I'm talking about, you, the man leaves father and mother and cleaves to his wife. Okay, And I said that they ought to be friends. Well, guess what? Before he leaves and cleaves to his wife, who were his friends then? Well, his mother and father were his friends. His brother and sister, you know, or whatever, were the friends. And so here, uh, uh, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, right? That implies that that brother should be a friend. <laughs> now, you might find a friend that sticks even closer than a, than a brother, but that brother should be a friend. And, you know, we all, we talked about this morning, show of hands, who had uh, brothers and sisters growing up, and, and how sometimes brothers and sisters don't get along, they pick at each other or whatever. But I'm going to tell you, that ought to be a dear friend in your life. And hopefully many, many years to come, they'll still be friends of yours. But while you're at home, you say, well, I'm not married. I don't have a spouse to be a friend with. Well, you might have a mother and a father. You might have a, a brother or sister to be your friend. Uh, our kids, uh, because of the, you know, going off to Bible college and wanting to be in the ministry and however God's going to use me and then uh, transitioning over here as a youth pastor and then the uh, now the pastor and in a smaller church 
You know, not a whole lot of, and then my kids are homeschooled, so they don't go to school where there's lots of people that, they, that can be their friends. Of course, some of those might be that bad type of friend I was talking about, <laughs> most definitely, if you're in public school. Uh, so we had a problem growing up. Oh, wow, our kids don't have friends. I feel like a bad dad because I don't have lots of friends my kids can, my kids can go hang out with, like I did when I was growing up. Which, by the way, I had some good friends, but I also had friends that led me down some bad paths. And I myself was, you know, away from mom and dad. It wasn't always a great influence on uh, people that were friends at that time. But to develop that relationship with your mother and father in a Christian home is ideal. That's the way that God planned it, and that's the way that it should be. And you can have friends with your parents and your, and your family. And, uh, and you should. You should be able to do that. Okay, uh, so... The second thing, uh, the second person that should be your friend is your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the Bible talks a lot about how that relationship is very similar to your relationship at home and how you should actually treat the elder women in the church as your mother your gra or your grandmother, and you should respect them that way, have some sort, somewhat of that relationship with you. And, uh, you know, I love my grandma. But she's in Michigan. I don't see her very much. But many ladies in this room have been sort of like a mom or a grandma to me. I got the luxury of having my mom as a member who comes down quite a bit as well in the service. So she's my mom. And then she's also a member of the church that I would treat like a mom, even if she wasn't my mom. And even uh, Capri called her grandma this morning. I think so. Hey, that's how it works. I got a bunch of grandmas. <laughs> that's why on that track that we give out, it has a picture of a little, little kid with kisses all over their face. Kind of weird. I mean, kind of like, it makes me think of Biden, but <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but you know, it's true. Like a grandma church, I shouldn't have done. I, I, I intended to stay away from anything even close to politics today. <laughs> but we have a lot of grandmas in this church is what I'm getting at. All right, moving on. As Christians, we're supposed to come out of the world, right? Everybody agree with that? We're supposed to come out of the world and be ye separate, the Bible says. Be ye separate, meaning there should be a distinction. You have, you have the world. The philosophies of the world, the uh, mentality of the world, the mindset of the world. And then you have Christians who are not of this world. Now, we are in this world. The Bible says we can't do anything about that. We can't go out of this world. So therefore, we're going to have to constantly interact with people of this world. But they're not necessarily our friends. They're not necessarily the people that we hang out with and that we spend a lot of time with and, and, and everything because like I said, sometimes they end up not being friends at all. And so we have to actually uh, have friends in a community of believers. The Bible says in Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 10, 25, it says that uh, you should not forsake the assembling of yourselves together uh, with one another. So we, as believers, we don't want to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Say, okay, and this is believers. This is what church is all about. Actually, that's what church means, is a congregation of believers, like-minded believers uh, meeting together for the same cause there. And so we have brothers and sisters in Christ who should be our friends. Look at James chapter 4, 4. James 4, 4. This one is a hard verse for some people to, to, to get, especially if they're just newly saved, just becoming Christians, and, uh, and then they see that there has to be a distinction between the world and following Christ, and, and you say, well, well, I don't understand that. I mean, shouldn't we just be able to hang out and be friends with everybody? Well, here's what the Bible says in uh, James. Oops, turned the wrong book. James chapter 4. And verse 4, <clears throat> he's talking to believers here, okay? And he's using the word, uh, the term adulterers and adulteresses symbolically, all right? In other words, uh, if you get the context here, talking to believers who should be in love with the Lord, but they're going after the world instead of, instead of following the Lord, okay? So he calls them adulterers and adulteresses. And you'll see that in the context. He says, ye adulterers and adulteresses... Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? 
Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is in, is enemy of God. Now I don't want to be the enemy of God. <laughs> I love the Lord and I want him to be happy with the choices I make in life and the things that I do and the, and the relationships that I have. And I want him to bless that. And like I said, we're going to daily be around people that don't believe like us. We should be an influence to them, try to get them saved, first of all, get them in church, help them learn how to be a part of the family of God. But at, at, the, at the time that they're just living like they naturally do in the flesh, that would be worldly. Naturally, we're part of this world. Without Christ, we're going to do the things that are uh, part of the philosophies of this world. Okay, and the Bible talks about these types of things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These are the things that are in the world. These are the types of things that are going to be just natural for us to want to do, but they're worldly things. And if we're friends with those who embrace those kind of mentalities and those worldly things, then the Bible says we're going against God. Why is that? Because they go against God. And so if we're a friend of them, guess what? You were a friend of the enemy of God. And so that makes us the enemy of God. Okay. And we got, uh, we don't want to do that. So we need to be careful to make sure our friends are brothers and sisters in Christ. Those who are going to help us, those who are going to encourage us to follow the Lord. They're going to say good, uh, the right things to us, not flatter us, but speak the truth and love and try to keep us uh, from harm and to keep us walking with the Lord. Okay. The world should know that you are a disciple of Christ. If you are a disciple of Christ, now, I've preached this many times from this pulpit that in the Bible, we see Jesus walking around teaching his disciples. And he was saying some harsh things to his disciples. Man, you got to forsake the world. You got to do this. You got to follow me. You got to be willing to leave everything behind you and not even have a house sometimes or whatever. You got to follow me. You got to be willing to be persecuted by all men and hated and all this kind of stuff. And he was preaching to the disciples when he did that. But meanwhile, there were multitudes of people that were following him. And most of those people following him just wanted the food, all right? Hey, if you came here because we're having a potluck afterward, praise the Lord, I'm glad you're, <laughs> you're here. But this is the case. Some people followed Jesus because he could turn the loaves, five loaves, right, and two fishes into multitudes and feed 5,000. They followed him because he could give sight to the blind man. They followed him because he could heal the crippled man. And they, did, they followed him because he had this power to do something for them. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. You want to be my disciple, you're going to have to do something for the Lord. You're going to have to lay up your treasures in heaven, not here on earth. And so, he, so they followed. But there were also, like I said, multitude. There were people that got saved. They put their trust in Jesus Christ as far as being their savior. They just never got on board with following and being a disciple that was willing to give up the things of this world to the extent that Jesus was saying. Okay, But he continued to preach uh, to everybody. But if you are a disciple, a follower of Christ, that's something that should be evident. Something that people should see. And here's what it says uh, in John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. And look, all right, let me just stop there. If you don't know yet what the rest of that verse says. Let's just think, God, if, if Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Right? When they watch you, they're going to know you're my disciple. You might say, going to church? Well, yeah, if you go to church, you know, they would probably have a decide hey, that you must be a disciple. Some people here in this room go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, soul winning on Tuesday, you know, whatever. They're, they're going to church all the time. I, I guarantee people will look at them and say, they must be a disciple of Christ, right? What about, uh, you know, hey, their language changes. They stop cussing. They stop talking. You know, they stop lying. They stop, you know, their relationships change. All this, you would think, hey, that's what he would say. If they're, they're going to know that you're a disciple of Christ, you're going to do all these kinds of things. But actually, here's what he says. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. If ye have one, love one to another. Talk to his disciples. Hey, when they see the kind of love that you have... Let's say this. When visit, we have a few visitors today. I hope that they saw in this church, man, these people love each other. And it's not fake. <laughs> they genuinely love each other. They can't help but, uh, you know, I saw people hugging each other. And I'm like, oh, people are going to get scared about COVID. And should we really be hugging each other and all this? You know what? You love each other. You can't help it. <laughs> 
You love each other. You want to do things for each other. You want to uh, ask, how you doing, man? I, I, you know, I heard, how's your family? I mean, you're, you're caring, you're loving each other. I think people, the world should see Christians like, man, they just can't wait to assemble together. They can't wait to just go out there and, uh, and encourage one another. And, uh, and, and they see the love. That's true love of brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, so first of all, you should be a friend with your spouse. Secondly, you should be a friend with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And that leads right into the last one, which is this. You should be a friend of God. You should be a friend of God. Okay, and, uh, and you might say, I can't be friends with God. I mean, this concept kind of puzzles me a little bit because you're like, I can't be a friend of God. I mean, God is the Lord. I can't. When in his presence, men fall to their knees, they fall on their face and say, I can't be in the presence of a holy God, right? I, I can't be his friend because he's so much holier than I am. He's so much powerful. He's my Lord. I can't be a friend if he's my Lord. You might say, well, he's a king. A peasant like me can't be friends with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You might say, I can't be his friend. He's my master. I'm his servant, right? I'm supposed to be washing his feet. I'm supposed uh, Jesus' feet. That's a, that's, uh, I don't have time to get into that. Okay, but we should be washing his feet. We're, he's a servant. We're wanting to do that. We're wanting to serve him. We're wanting to, hey, yes, master, tell me where, give me my marching orders. What should I do? You're my master. And it's true. All those things are true. He is the Lord of Lords, all right? Everybody, if they don't recognize that, there will be one day where every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It will be confessed whether they actually believe that and accept it or not. They'll confess it because it's true. He is the Lord, you know? And everybody ought to recognize he will one day be the king of kings who will rule over this world. I don't have time to talk about the millennial uh, reign of Christ, thousand year reign of Christ that the Bible talks about. But he will physically rule and reign on this earth, you know, and you there's never been a better king. All right. than he will be. But he will be. And he is our master. And we do need to recognize that what he says goes. If he tells us to do something in his word, we need to do it. If he says not to do something, we need not to do it. He is our master. There's nothing wrong with accepting that and acknowledging that. But look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And we read 13 this morning. It says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, verse 14 says this, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I commanded you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give it to you. Great chapter, this whole chapter, I, I, I just keep on reading it. But I want to focus in on there where he tells the disciples, look, I don't call you, uh, I, I mean, yes, he's still their master, but he says, I call you not servants, but I call you friend, friend. And he says this, he says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever things I've commanded you. And that's really important that we understand that. But we don't want to be confused and say like this. Well, you know, God's only going to be our friend if we keep all of the commandments. He's only going to be our friend if we follow the Ten Commandments. And if we break that, he's no longer our friend. That's not what he said. He said, I'm your friend if you do, if you obey what I've told you. Now, I want you to go to Galatians chapter 3 and see something very important here. How do we become a friend of God? Through obedience. Uh, what did I say? Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Now, realize that Paul 
had preached to these Galatians, this church here at Galatia, he had preached to them the gospel, and they had put their faith in Jesus Christ, and they had claimed to at least. They said that they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And now he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you, this only would I learn of you, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Okay, and so he's saying here, who hath bewitched you, who, who, who's tricked you into thinking that you could get to heaven by your works, or that your works have any part of your salvation? Who's tricked you because I didn't teach you that? He says, he says uh, uh, who has bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Okay, what he's talking about is the truth of the gospel. And that phrase is used many times in the Bible, say obeying the gospel, obeying the truth of the gospel. Okay, what is the truth of the gospel? Well, the truth of the gospel is very simply this. In our current condition as sinners, who anybody here ever sinned? Okay, I should say, has anybody in here ever not sinned? If that's you, you can step outside. I will send somebody to talk with you because the Bible says you're a liar and a deceiver. <laughs> We've all sinned. We've all sinned. We've come short of the glory of God. Again, I'm your friend. I don't want to offend you, but I want to tell you the truth. And the truth is you're a sinner just like I'm a sinner and everybody in here is a sinner. The truth of the gospel is we have all sinned. And in our current condition, because we've sinned, the Bible says the wages of our sin is death. We've all got to die. Everyone in here is going to die. And uh, not only the first death, the physical death, but the Bible says death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. Okay, and this would be what we would call hell, probably like lake of fire makes you think of hell. It cast into the lake of fire, which it says is the second death. All right. Now, we're all going to die physically on this earth. You know, we, that's just how it works. You can try to add some years to your life by being healthy and all, but you're going to die, unfortunately. Oh, uh, actually, fortunately, because I don't want to live in this body forever, <laughs> right? So you're going to die. But then the Bible says that there's a second death, okay? And that's what it's talking about when it says the wages of sin is death, all right? Is that because of our sin, because of the condition that we're in, because, due to that sin, we are all destined for an eternity in the lake of fire, all right? That's not pleasant to talk about, but that's what the Bible says. Now, the gospel or the good news is this. Jesus Christ, I mean, this is what 1 Corinthians 15 says the gospel is. Jesus Christ died, right? He was crucified on the cross. Then he was buried, and then he rose again. Now, this last week, we, we went out soul winning every day, knocking on doors to give the people the gospel. And we would knock on doors, and oftentimes it would go something like, you know, uh, hey, we want to invite you to church. I'm the pastor at such and such. And, and we would go through all those formalities, and they would say, but, more, you know, they, they would tell us whether or not they go to church or whatever. And I'm trying to get to this question. More importantly than whether or not you go to church, do you know for sure if you were to die that you would go to heaven? And when you ask that question, People begin to say, well, I, I don't think anybody can know for sure. Well, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? Well, I think you got to be good and you got to live right and you got to obey the commandments and you got to do all this. And what they're saying is almost like there's a scale and God's going to weigh out your good and your bad. And if I was if I was good enough, he'll look at that and say, OK, I'll let you go to heaven. That's that's what most people think out there. And I can guarantee you that most people think that at least in this town and in Kansas City, because when we knock on doors, that's what they say a person has to do to go to heaven. You got to be good. You got to live right. You got to obey the commandments. You got to uh, feed the poor. You got to love your neighbor. These are the things that they say. So my question to them is always, OK, if you can get to heaven by being good, why did Jesus have to die? Because most people know Jesus died on the cross and he was buried and they rose again. Well, what, what, what in the world did he have to do that for? If I can get to heaven on my own works, if I can get to heaven and say, God, I know I messed up sometimes, but I was pretty good. I mean, I, I never killed anybody and I did, you know, rescue that cat out of a tree one time. Hey, I'm not kidding. People have said, I think I'm going to heaven because I rescued animals. Okay. People think that their good works can get them to heaven. And the fact of the matter is all of us, deserve to die and go to hell. 
in our natural con condition. <clears throat> and so when Jesus said, uh, I mean, when Jesus died on the cross, you have to wonder, well, what was that all about? Why did he do that? And the Bible makes it very clear, this is the gospel or the good news because this. The reason he did that was for you. The reason he did that was for me. Because, you know, I can never pay for my sins. I can never pay my way to get into heaven. But when he died on the cross, the Bible says he was a sacrifice. And it says he was a substitute, right, taking our place. The only perfect son of God, right? He was 100% man because he was born of a woman, but he had no father. The Bible says he was with, she was with child of the Holy Ghost, right? So he has got one part, uh, or actually, I mean, his makeup his huma is hum human, right? He's 100% human, but then he's also 100% God, all right? So therefore, he alone has the ability, the makeup to be perfect and to be that sacrifice. Because if I said, you know, God, I, I really want everybody in here to go to heaven. Would you please just take my life and give them eternal life? You know, I will sacrifice my life for them. God will look at me and say, you need somebody to save you. <laughs> You're a sinner. You can't do that, right? So I needed somebody to save me. And the only way I could be saved is by saying, hmm, why did Jesus die on the cross? Why was he buried? Why did he raise again the third day? Well, he did that so that I might have eternal life. And the Bible says that uh, for by grace, that's something that would be free. If I gave you a grace period, you owed me some money and I gave you a grace period, I'm giving you free time. Right? <laughs> I guess that's one way to look at it, is grace, okay? And it says, for by grace are you saved, look, look at this, through faith, all right? That's what saves you. Your works don't save you. Doing good things doesn't save you. Baptism doesn't save you. For by grace are you saved through faith. And then it says, and not of yourselves, nothing in you, it's the gift of God, a gift. What was that gift? Jesus died on the cross. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the promise of the gospel. The gospel is Jesus died for you. Now, do you receive it? Do you receive that as your substitute, you know, so that you don't have to die and go to hell? I receive Jesus Christ as my substitute. The Bible says that if you do that, that's called faith. All right, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm putting my faith. I can't see your heart. I don't know if you really decide to do that, but I'm putting my faith in Jesus alone for my salvation. It says it's faith. Now, I want to close with this verse, James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And look at verse 22. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled. This is our scripture of the week, you might notice. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called, look at that, the friend of God. The only way you can be a friend of God is by obeying the gospel. The only way you can obey the gospel is say, I receive what Jesus Christ did for me to save me from my sins. Otherwise, I have no hope and my eternal destiny is hell. But I want to receive Jesus Christ and I want to put my faith in him. And therefore, I want to be a friend of God. Look, he's the best friend you can ever have. In fact, let's go through this again. Your spouse, right? We already talked about what a bad friend would try to get you to have a relationship with the wrong kind of person. Your spouse should be somebody that you agree with, by the way. They should be believers too. The Bible says you shouldn't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You should put your uh, uh, relationship that when you leave mother and father cling to your wife, it should be somebody who is a godly woman who is saved as well. Uh, how about your friend that should be a, uh, a brother and sister in Christ? Well, what's so significant about that? Because you got something in common. God is your friend, right? And so 
actually the most important thing, important thing in the world is that you would be a friend of God. And he wants to be your friend. He wants to be your friend so bad that look at this. He died on the cross. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The question is, are you going to be a friend of God? It's your choice. Let's all stand with our heads bowed.